Well, once again, it's special ops time, and boy, do we have one hell of a mission for you all this evening. So, my dear friends, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, and listen. My alarm clock blared at 6am, as it usually did. I normally went on a run before eating breakfast, but as I went to snooze the alarm off, a notification popped up. Twelve missed calls from an unfamiliar number. Who could this be? I thought. Curious to know, I left my wife snoring away in the bed and made my way into the conservatory where no one could hear. I called the number back. The line rang for a few seconds until someone hastily picked up. Uh, hello. A man spoke in a posh British accent. Hey, I um, received a few calls from this number last night. Oh, right. You must be Mr. McCarthy. Yeah, speaking. Can I please ask why you called me so many times during the night? I was given your number by a former colleague of yours, Colonel Hansen. We have a uh, situation that requires your expertise. Oh, Hansen, I sighed. The man was my commanding officer when I worked for the SDF, a uh, private military company that fought supernatural creatures. Yeah, I um, yeah, I know him quite well, but the nature of our work was highly classified, and thus I don't think I'd be of any help to you. Well, he said you were our best shot at dealing with this situation. Hmm. You keep going on about this situation. Care to explain what exactly it is? A few hours ago, the bodies of five teenagers were found in the woods, deep bite marks in their necks, sucked bone dry of blood. We called the SDF as his protocol to deal with a situation like this. We were notified that their units are currently spread out rather thinly and couldn't deal with the situation presently. And Colonel Hansen gave me your contact number and said you have extensive experience dealing with the creature that was responsible for the attack. Oh, damn it. I retired from that field years ago. I'm not really looking to get back into it as I have a family and two children to look after. Well, you will be handsomely rewarded. Considerably more than what you were paid at the SDF. Besides, we will only contact you when your skills are needed. You will be a subcontractor with the full freedom to work as you wish. If you do a good job on this mission, there will be more work for you. So, what's the pay like? I asked without trying to sound greedy. I really needed the cash to pay my mortgage, as I was a few payments behind. Having been unemployed for the last six months, times had been hard. This opportunity could potentially help me get out of my debt crisis. For this mission, five grand. What? You have to be kidding. I'm not going to put my life on the line for five lousy grand. Look, make it ten and you have a deal. I negotiated without sounding too snarky. Please, Mr. McCarthy, you have to understand that we are not made of money... Listen, I cut him off. If you want a proper job done, then it's going to cost you money. I need to pay for weapons, ammunition, and put my own life on the line. The SDF had procedures and backup in place in case the mission went south. This was going to be me working on my own. If anything went wrong, it was my life on the line. Ah, you drive a hard bargain, the man said. All right, ten it is. I'll send you an email with the contact and non-disclosure agreement. Please read it, sign it, and send it back before my men pick you up at 10 a.m. All right, but please make sure no one fucks around with the bodies. Makes my job harder than it already is with them CSI assholes trampling over everything. <sighs> Understood. I'll let you prepare for the mission. The man finished before hanging up the phone. I quickly went down into the basement and began unpacking my equipment that had been in storage for the last few years. A thick layer of dust covered the chest which contained my armour. It took an hour to get everything all cleaned up. I changed into it and walked towards my gun cabinet. I tapped in the code before it unlocked with a click. I picked out my fully automatic FN Scar H and attached it to my bulletproof vest before doing the same with my Colt M1911. I filled my ammo pouches with the multiple magazines of silver titanium bullets for both weapons and made my way upstairs. 
My wife caught me in the uniform and stared at me with her mouth wide open. I knew what she was thinking. I promised her that I wouldn't fight monsters anymore, but people's lives were at stake and I was the only one with the skills to deal with it. I received a call in the morning. They want me to work a contract. I said, knowing quite well she knew what she was going to say next. I thought you were done with that life. She frowned as her blood began to boil and her skin turned a rosy red. She fucking hated seeing me in the uniform. The thought of me leaving never to return probably lingered in her mind. Yeah, I am. This is different. It's a contract. Look, when it's done, I get paid ten grand and come straight home. People's lives are in danger. Without me, more people will die. Come on, we need the money to pay the bills. Otherwise, we'll be without a home, I pleaded. She sighed before nodding, giving me the okay. But I knew she wasn't happy deep inside. She quietly made me breakfast before we all ate. I logged into my emails and signed both the contract and the NDA. I spent the rest of my time with my wife and children until the clock struck 10am. The sound of a large diesel engine hummed outside. That was my cue to go, but before I did, I hugged and kissed them all goodbye. Two men dressed in black suits greeted me at the door and motioned me into the large, blacked-out SUV before setting off towards the scene. Once I arrived, a police officer greeted me at the cordoned-off area. Mr. McCarthy, I've been awaiting your arrival, he said before lifting the yellow strip and allowing me to pass. They weren't messing around when they said they were sending in a professional, he said, staring at my gun. I just nodded and walked towards the scene where I'd noticed the lifeless, deformed bodies of the teenagers. I sure could have used that fancy SDF equipment to examine the murder scene, but, well, I was on my own, so I conducted it the good old-fashioned way. First body, young male in his teens, sucked completely dry of blood, skin shriveled up like a raisin. Bite marks in the neck where the blood was extracted. Deep claw marks on the body, pissed all the way through to the bone. No organs were extracted. Large footprints near the body. I checked the other bodies and made sure there was nothing else that was missed. All evidence led me to believe it was only their blood the creature was after. Well, it could be anything. Vampire, ghoul, blood phages, baoban, rocker or kubi. Ah, the list goes on. The large footprints in the dirt didn't give me much to work with, as they'd been trampled over a few times by the boots of the police officers. The attack was conducted in a fast and efficient manner, as there was no sign of struggle. Upon further inspection of the surrounding fauna and trees, I discovered a trail that led further into the forest. I approached the police officer to explain the situation. Hey mate, so, uh, find anything? He asked. Yeah, I've done my investigation on the bodies. You can do the CSI thing. There's a trail that leads further into the forest. I'm going to go check it out. All right, I'll get my men to take care of the bodies. Oh, also, before you go, I was asked to give you this PDA and this headset so you can keep in contact with the boss. The PDA came with a wrist mount and a wiring harness that led all the way to my ear. It should already have its frequency saved in the radio. Once it was set up, I followed the path for what seemed like hours until I reached a small clearing in the forest where I heard a deep growl and hid behind a small bush to observe the clearing. The broad silhouette of the creature gnawed on a dismembered limb, chomping away through squishy flesh and crunchy bones. I cocked my battle rifle and switched the safety off. The creature stopped in its tracks and looked around. Oh, damn it. Must have heard that. Oh, I'm getting old and rusty. Could cost me my life. It ran towards me before I could let a round off, and it leaped on top of me and began pounding on my chest. Oh, each blow felt like a cannonball smashing into me. The only thing that kept me alive was my armor. Kevlar reinforced with hardened titanium plates. While well, the creature pummeled my ribcage, I reached for my sidearm and aimed it upwards and let off a few shots blood spewed from its chest, raining down upon me and a stream down its face where a bullet had kissed its cheek. 
The creature leaped off me and violently growled in a fit of rage as the silver reacted with its blood. The best way I can describe its effect is that it burned through its skin like highly concentrated acid. Taking my one and only opportunity, I raised my rifle and aimed for its head before blowing its brains out all over the dirty grass. My ribcage felt as if it was about to collapse in on itself as crimson streams began to spill from where the armor was compromised. I checked my PDA and called the only radio frequency that was saved. McCarthy! The posh British man called out. I coughed up a mouthful of blood. Oh, it's dealt with, although it got me pretty bad. I'm bleeding out and I won't be able to make it. Hold on, I've got your GPS coordinates. I'm sending an air ambulance to your location now. He finished as I hit the ground like a rock. My vision began to blur before slowly I nearly lost consciousness. I noticed that evening loomed and darkness began to blanket the forest. And a growl emanated in the distance. Oh fuck, there's more of them. My hand trembled as I reached for my med kit. After a few failed attempts, I finally got it out and placed it on my chest as I laid on my back. I pricked the syringe deep into my leg and let it loose into my system, numbing the pain enough so I could move. I had about 20 minutes to hold out before it came into full effect. With every little ounce of strength that remained within me, I managed to drag my almost lifeless body to the foot of a nearby tree and rested my back upon its coarse skin. I spent the next five minutes fighting the pain away as the morphine did its thing. The sky had darkened to the point it became impossible to see further than 10 meters ahead, the shadows of the trees only adding to my disadvantage. Without any sort of night vision gear, this situation had gone from being bad to worse. Just my freaking bad luck, eh? But I was determined to get out of this alive. In the distance, I heard the humming of a helicopter as it flew into audible range. The rustling of trees and fauna caught my attention as multiple footsteps closed in. With my sight still blurred, I aimed my rifle through the space between the trees where six dark silhouettes emerged through the fingertips of bushes. Their attention was fixated on the deceased body of their kin before suddenly turning towards me with anger in their gleaming amber eyes. Oh, I am fucked. All six of these creatures were larger and looked more intimidating than the one I killed earlier. I couldn't see much in the dark so it's difficult for me to explain what they look like. Without hesitation, I flicked the rifle into fully automatic and squeezed the trigger. Silver rained down upon their swift movements as they neared. Most of my shots missed their mark, but within a few seconds, only two would not make their end. I realized no more bullets were being fired from my rifle. My magazine had run dry. Oh, shit. By the time it was reloaded, I would have most likely met my end, so I went for the pistol, only to realize I dropped it in the struggle with the first one. Oh, fuck, I screamed, seconds before they extracted their revenge. I closed my eyes and took a final breath of air, and prepared to meet my end. The sound of two high-caliber shots ripped through the air. I squinted my eyes open to the sight of the creatures crashing into the dirt next to my boots, the giant gaping holes through their heads. I'd been saved just in the nick of time. If they'd arrived just a second later, I would have been in the morgue come morning. I sighed in relief as I discovered the helicopter hovering over my head, and the barrel of a sniper rifle sticking out the side. My radio crackled with a tone. I clicked the button on the PDA to accept the call. McCarthy, are you all right down there? The voice of the British guy asked. Oh, could be better. I sighed nearly out of breath. Just get your people down here before I bleed out. The medics patched me up before rushing me to the nearest military hospital, where they conducted some tests. The battle with the creatures had left me with heavy bruising, three broken ribs, and a nice scar where one of the metal plates in my armor had lodged itself in my belly. The doctors advised me to take it easy for a few months and discharge me. I called an Uber and made my way back home. Once I arrived, I noticed a black SUV waiting for me in the driveway. 
A man in a black suit asked me to get in. Once inside, I noticed a man sitting in the other rear passenger seat. I'm glad you made it, Mr. McCarthy. It would have been a shame to lose you so early on. It was the same man I'd been in contact with over the phone. Yeah, me too. So I finally get to meet you in the flesh, I smirked. The doctors have told me to take it easy for a while, so don't expect me to be in action any time soon. Uh, I know, he said, passing me a thick envelope. Ten grand as promised. But before I let you go, there's something I need to tell you. Yeah? What is it? I asked, curious to know more. We retrieved the bodies of the creatures and sent them back to the SDF for analysis. The research team conducted some tests on their bodies, and they didn't match anything that they had on their records. There was evidence that their DNA markers had been tampered with. Wait, so you're trying to say that they were created by someone. I was dumbfounded at the idea that some sick asshole actually went out of his way to make these bloodthirsty creatures. Exactly. Someone genetically spliced the DNA of multiple creatures and modified it to be far superior than what you would normally encounter. Oh, for fuck's sake. That means there could be more attacks. God, that dick's still out there. I nodded my head in disapproval. More people's lives would be at stake if this person kept creating more monsters. Yeah, get yourself back in shape, and I'll be in contact with you in the coming months. All right, thanks for the prompt payment. I waved him goodbye as the SUV made its way out of the estate. I made my way to the door and opened it with my key. My children jumped me just as I entered, causing a sharp pain in my ribs. <laughs> Take it easy, kiddos. I'm not feeling too good, I said through gritted teeth, holding the pain back. I hugged and kissed my wife, passing her the large envelope of cash. She snatched it out of my hand before I could react. It was the only way to keep her from flipping her shit. Well, at least we had enough money to pay off our debts. My wife made me a nice warm meal before I hit the bed to recover. A month had passed, and I began to freely move around without feeling the pain of my injuries. I decided to join the gym and get fit once again. I also started practicing at the shooting range, knowing full well my specialist skills would be needed in the future. I just couldn't believe the stupidity of some people. Why would they want to make their world a more dangerous place by creating dangerous monsters? God, such assholes. A few months had passed. We were running out of cash and times were becoming difficult again. I was about to hit the deck late in the evening, as I usually did, when my phone rang. As I went to answer, I recognized the number right off the bat. It was the posh British guy again. Hello, I answered, moving into the conservatory. It's uh, me again. We have um, a situation. Are you, uh, are you ready to be picked up? He stumbled through his words in a rush, as if something big had gone down. Well, I couldn't contain my excitement. Count me in. Now I know what you guys are going to say, but fighting these monsters gives me a buzz. The SUV is now parked outside, ready to pick me up. The SUV took me to a farmhouse after a two-hour journey. Once there, the men in the black suits told me to head on inside. As I approached the door... I noticed the other vehicle sat upon the grassy patch before the fields of corn began. I entered the building to be greeted by the British guy who'd been waiting for my arrival. Ah, glad you got here in good time. The others are waiting. Others? I asked. Yeah, you're going to need backup where you're going. He sighed before taking me into a large room where two men and a woman sat around a large wooden table. Jessica Stone. The sniper who'd saved me from a horrific demise at the hands of the creatures in the forest greeted me with a nod. I'd met her once before whilst working at the SDF. She was working with the ranger unit on a top-secret mission that I wasn't a part of. From what I knew of her, she was very skilled in her marksmanship. The other two were new to me. A younger-looking man who looked like he was a special forces operative. The other, 
a middle-aged African-American guy who was built like a tank. I sat in one of the vacant seats and waited for the British guy to begin his mission briefing. Right, all of you are here. Some of you have met before, but for those who haven't, you'll have plenty of time to greet each other later. You're probably wondering why I've gathered you here on such short notice, so I'll get to the point. A few months ago, we discovered that someone was genetically engineering creatures. We don't know the reason why, nor do we know their motives. The SDF has conducted a thorough investigation and concluded that samples from various creatures had gone missing around the same time that one of their research staff had left the agency. We finally have the coordinates of his lab. Your job is to secure it and gather any intel on where he could be. A transport helicopter will arrive to take you there in 15. Any questions? Yeah, I put my hand up. My armor was heavily damaged last time. Could also do with some better weapons. The SDF has given us four of their Mark II Ranger suits. They've been custom built to your specifications, along with some of their state-of-the-art weaponry. If you'll all follow me to the other room. He finished before leading us to the room next door. As I entered the room behind the others, I noticed four suits resting upon armor stands. We all got changed into the suits and instantly noticed they were lighter and more comfortable than all current variants of body armor. The helmets covered our full faces and had a large curved visor which displayed a heads-up display along with settings for night and thermal vision. I had heard of these suits but never seen them in the flesh. All the SDF rangers wore suits like this now as standard. Across the room was a large glass weapons case filled to the brim with rifles, attachments, and ammunition. I picked out a modified Mark 17 with a red dot scope, a better grip, and a small grenade launcher. I noticed a familiar pistol, the M1911, and took it along too with my ammunition for my weapons. Jessica picked the Barrett XM109. I guess it was a better choice for her slender body than the 50 caliber due to less kickback. Brian Anthony, the big tank, pulled out a Benelli M3 Super 90 along with a few boxes of ammunition. Carl Walker, the special ops guy, chose to go with the MK-16, similar to the Mark 17, except it used 556 rounds rather than 762. According to him, he preferred accuracy and a larger magazine over firepower. The four of us moved outside as an MV-22 Osprey prepared to land in the large space in front of the farmhouse. We all got aboard before setting off. Heard you served in the SDF, Carl inquired after pressing a button on his helmet to switch his comms on. Yeah, I left a few years back. I'm sorry, I don't know much about you guys except for Jessica. I replied. I was in the Navy SEALs for five years before leaving last summer. That British guy called me and asked if I was up for a mission. Well, I was itching for some action, so I decided to take him up on his offer. Big guy over there is Brian. We are in the same unit back in the Navy. He's a decent guy, although he can be quiet sometimes. He'll be alright once he gets to know the two of you. By the way, who's the girl? Yeah, that's Jessica. Expert sniper. Saved my ass a few months ago while I was on a mission. Awesome. Do you know how long till we get there? No idea. I hope we get there soon. I need a piss. I said jokingly. An hour had passed. We finally arrived in an old concrete complex surrounded by nothing but endless woodland. The helicopter hovered above a clearing big enough to land before dropping down to the ground. We all jumped out, weapons drawn, surveyed our surroundings before clearing the Osprey for takeoff. Everybody switched their radios on before we advanced upon the entrance of the structure. A large bulkhead door prevented us from entering. Carl removed the fascia plate on the intercom and began to fiddle with the wires until a click behind the wall sounded. Brian opened the door, aiming his shotgun into the darkness that lay before us, leading us in. After the light from the entrance faded, we switched to night vision. A long hallway took us to a large chamber where multiple computers and screens were smashed up littering the floor. The place was a complete mess. 
as if everyone had just left in a hurry. Whoever was here left in a hurry and destroyed their equipment, Carl said. Yeah, unless something went wrong with the experiments. Keep your eyes peeled and weapons at the ready, I said, turning to face another open door that led deeper. We entered and discovered five lifeless bodies of research staff that had been torn limb from limb, covered in puddles of dried, crusty, decayed blood. The disgusting aroma that filled the air was a hundred times worse than the horrific sight before us. I observed the bodies closely, trying to figure out what we were dealing with. That was when a loud screech emanated from one of the connecting rooms, followed by a plethora of growls, howls, and unnatural sounds. Shit, we got company. Ready your weapons, aim for the heads, and keep your distance. I warned the others as the bloodthirsty creatures closed in on our position. I switched my weapon to the burst fire setting and waited for the enemy to appear. The silhouettes of deformed creatures emerged from the dark depths of the corridor. Jessica fired her rifle. The first wave of creatures hit the cold concrete floor covered with chunks of brain. I need to reload, she stated after emptying her magazine and moving a few steps back. A dozen more trudged through the lifeless bodies of their friends towards us. I stepped forward along with Carl and let loose a shower of silver bullets. Brian, you stay back until we need to reload, then cover us with the shotgun. All right, Brian agreed, stepping to the side to wait for his turn. After about a minute or so, our magazines had run dry. We moved a few steps back and reloaded whilst Brian pummeled them with silver buckshot. Once his seven shells had been spent, Carl and I got back to work. In the distance, I noticed the outline of a skinny female. Her long, dark hair covered her torso, and her shriveled-up skin looked like the scales of a lizard. Her long, stretched-out arms, along with razor-sharp talons at her fingertips, resembled spears. Fuck. Keep your distance. That siren scream is powerful enough to pop your eardrums out of existence. We all took a few steps back. Let me take a shot at her head, Jessica stated before aiming her rifle at the siren's head and squeezing the trigger. Before the bullet could hit her, the siren screamed, launching a powerful shockwave in our direction. Well, it knocked us all back off our feet onto the hard concrete floor. The silver bullet had ricocheted off the shockwave and hit the wall behind us. Now, I've killed a few sirens back when I was a ranger in the SDF, but I've never faced one this powerful. The immense power of that attack caused cracks to appear in the face of the reinforced walls and small chunks to hit the ground from the ceiling. Whoever had created this creature knew exactly what they were doing. A deafening silence filled my ears before I slowly regained my composure and sat up, aiming my rifle at the siren as it edged closer to us. My other teammates were still knocked out. Using the already weakened ceiling to my advantage, I loaded a 40mm grenade into my launcher and aimed the shot at its weakest point. Once the siren was directly under, I squeezed the trigger. The explosion sent large chunks of the ceiling, along with steel rods, down upon the petite body of the abomination, squashing it like a pancake. What the fuck was that? Carl asked, getting up. That was unlike any siren I have encountered. It was so powerful it knocked us a few feet back. Well, we're lucky we're wearing these helmets, otherwise we were going to be dead, I replied, keeping my aim on the rubble in case any other creatures appeared. Yeah, and that shockwave nearly sent all of us out of existence, Brian laughed, wiping away the dust off his suit before reloading more shells into his shotgun. You alright, Jessica? I asked, but received no reply. I went over to her after motioning the other two to keep an eye on the rubble. Hey, Jessica, you alright? I nearly shouted. I can't hear you. What are you saying? She asked with a raised voice, removing her helmet. Oh shit, I yelled. Your ears are bleeding. I said I can't hear you, she repeated. I motioned to her ears and she touched the blood before staring at her crimson hand. 
Oh, for fuck's sake, she screamed, wiping the blood away with a small tissue. I clicked the screen on my wrist-mounted PDA and hailed the British guy's frequency. Hello, the British guy called out. Yeah, we just engaged a group of creatures. Among them was an extremely powerful siren. Jessica got caught in the shockwave and needs medical assistance ASAP. All right, I'll send a medical extraction team to you within the hour. Have you gathered any intel on the enemy? He asked. Not as yet. We're currently observing the siren in case she makes a comeback. I never know exactly what these people have fucked around with. We can't take any chances. We'll radio back once we've conducted a thorough investigation. All right, stay safe. I will call you once the medical evacuation team is in the air. He finished before the line went dead. The next half an hour was spent walking around the complex in search of any information we could find. We discovered a large lab where the embryos of the creatures were being incubated along with a facility for splicing DNA. Oh, this is fucking disgusting, Carl snarled. Whoever is behind this obviously has a lot of money to finance such an operation, I replied as I noticed a small dot in the corner of the ceiling. Look over there. CCTV. Someone's watching us. Carl and Brian turned to take a look at the camera. There must still be power in this facility. If we find a fuse box, I might be able to get power back on to the lights and computers. Brian started looking around for wires and cables that could lead us there. Okay, let's split up. Brian and Carl, you guys try to get the power back online. Me and Jessica will try and find some more intel on what's going on. The others agreed to my plan, and we went to complete our objectives. What is going on? Jessica asked, still deaf. I typed a message on the PDA and sent it to her. I motioned to her to check her PDA. She read it and agreed. Well, it was about 20 minutes until the light switched back on. About the same time, I'd found a room containing a multitude of servers. Carl, you there? I asked over the radio. Yeah... Is the power back on? Positive. We found a server room. I'm assuming this is where they keep all their data. It's a lot larger than I thought it would be for a complex this size. All right, we're heading back to you now, Carl finished. It took them about 10 minutes to reach the room. Carl booted the main computer of the servers up and began scouring the hard drives for information. He called the British guy from his PDA and began explaining what he'd seen. Looks like this facility is a lot bigger than we initially thought. We're on the first level. There are three more levels, getting bigger as you go down. Oh, there's more to this place than we initially thought, he said when suddenly lines of code began to appear on the screen. Oh, fuck. Someone's hacking the server. I'm going to begin transferring data over to you before they delete it all. He plugged in a small USB to his PDA and began the wireless transfer. Only half of the data was transferred before everything was deleted. <sighs> That's all I could transfer. Carl frowned at the screen. Well, I'll send this data to the SDF to investigate. The evac should be there in the next five minutes, the British guy said, when the lights all turned off. What's going on? I asked. <sighs> Looks like the building's going back to lockdown mode. Damn it. We're not going to be able to get out, are we? I asked, looking at the screen where I saw the words, Lockdown Initiated. Carl typed endless lines of code into the computer. Look, if I can hack the system, I may be able to fool it into lifting the lockdown. Well, his efforts were useless apart from the unlocking of a door. And it led deeper into the facility. Fuck. He punched the computer screen in anger, causing a crack to appear. Well, look. There might be a secondary way out in the lower levels, I suggested. Yeah, but we don't have a clue what's down there, he sighed. So, what do you want us to do? He asked over the radio. Look, just investigate the lower levels while I sort something out from my end. We doubled back to the door where we'd entered the building to check if it was open since Carl had hacked the intercom, but it was locked shut. The lockdown must close all doors via the electronically controlled system they used. And so, with no other option, we made our way to the staircase leading to the lower levels, where an electronically controlled bulkhead stood a few inches open. Keep your guns at the ready. We don't know what's in there.
I warned the others. Carl stayed back with Jessica and explained the situation with a few gestures before we advanced further into the bowels of this mysterious complex. The lower level was considerably larger than the section that was above ground level. Rows of labs littered the corridors, vacant of any living souls. Tables and chairs had been thrown around, and most of the equipment had been smashed up beyond repair. Well, this place looks worse than what we saw upstairs, Carl stated. Yeah, I think whatever they were experimenting on must have escaped, causing a site-wide evacuation, I replied, glancing around. Well, there's no corpses or any sign of struggle except all this big mess, which means they either all escaped or something even more bizarre happened here, Brian said before something caught his attention. Hey, look over here, he pointed out. It's a doorway. We all turned to take a look, with Jessica understanding the situation moments later. A set of double doors led us to a section of the level where a multitude of high-security labs rested. Large bomb-proof glass panels protected us from a variety of bloodthirsty creatures behind them, each in their own locked cell. At the sight of us, they began hurling themselves towards the glass, bashing it with their malformed fists, leaving disgusting stains of slime and blood upon its surface. Some even bashed their heads in order to break through, but their efforts were all in vain, as the reinforced prison they were in did an exceptional job of holding them back. Oh, fuck, Carl stated. So these are the creatures they were creating? Yeah, I replied. Looks like a group of them had been in the chambers together and left to fight each other to the death. I pointed to the mess of corpses on the floor. Ah, oh, survival of the fittest, Brian added. These assholes were creating super monsters. Let's look around and see if there's a kill switch. Surely they must have one as a security measure. Good idea, I replied. We looked around for some time, but there was no kill switch. It was as if these cells were just designed for one purpose, to create the strongest monsters in existence. We found a small locked office in the far end of the room, where a security card was needed to proceed further. The only way to get through there is with a security card, Carl said. I can try hacking it, but it won't be any good with the lockdown in place. Might trigger a complete shutdown. Could result in all the creatures being let out. All right, I agreed. Let's split up and look around for a key card that can get us in. Well, these scientists left in a hurry, so let's assume they left their things behind, as any normal person would when in a life or death emergency scenario. Keep your radios online. Carl, you go with Jessica since she's having hearing issues. If you find something, radio back. Everyone agreed to the plan, and we set out to look for the keycard. After a tedious hour of scavenging every last nook and cranny of the level, I finally received word from Carl that he and Jessica had found a keycard in the ladies' restroom. It had been left in a handbag, presumably belonging to one of the doctors who'd worked in this facility. We all met back up at the door and crossed our fingers it would work. The lock clicked once the card touched the screen. Ah, abracadabra, baby, Carl grinned. We are in. Inside the small room, there was a desk along with a heap of paperwork and a laptop. Carl disconnected it from the network and began searching the hard drive for any information relating to the experiments that were being conducted. What we found shocked all of us to our bones. We discovered blueprints for a biological weapon designed to mutate and override normal brain function, which would result in normal people being transformed into the hideous creatures that were locked up in the laboratory cells. We also discovered that all the creatures in the cells were human at one point, and were subjected to the bioweapon for testing purposes. Well, I don't know about the others, but that just made me sick to my stomach. Fucking disgusting. They were normal people at one point, I snarled. It's just unbelievable. Let me transfer this data back to base. God, I can't look at this shit no more. Carl frowned, connecting his PDA to the computer before transferring the file. 
Jessica walked a few steps back before turning around to throw up. Brian looked as though he was about to do the same. I don't blame them. The contents of my breakfast were also about to make a comeback. Once the files had successfully been transferred, an error message popped up on the screen. Unauthorized file transfer detected. Initiate protocol alpha. Fuck. What's protocol alpha? Carl said seconds before we heard a multitude of locking mechanisms click open. Oh shit. The lab doors have opened. Weapons of the ready. Don't take any chances. Aim for the heads and conserve your ammo. I shouted, aiming my rifle down the long hallway where the monstrosities began to flood it with a furious hunger. They moved faster and more precisely than any creature I'd ever seen. Some even dodged our bullets with ease. Brian moved forward with his shotgun and unloaded a heap of shells, which did absolutely nothing to some of them. I loaded another grenade into my launcher and let loose at a group of creatures. Some fell upon the tile floor, but the others began to regenerate, and continued on their pilgrimage for our blood. Out of twenty, only four creatures remained by the time they reached the door. Now these bastards were a giant pain in our asses, kept dodging whatever we threw at them. I couldn't afford to use another grenade in such a short distance, as it could only lead to doing more damage to ourselves. The creatures leaped on top of us, using their arms and hands as batons to beat us down. We all ended up on the floor as the struggle became close quarters. It was four of us versus four genetically modified monsters. With all my strength, I managed to grab hold of the creature's neck and keep it away from biting a chunk of my helmet off. On a number of occasions, it had managed to dig its teeth through the reinforced visor and crack it, leaving streams of disgusting brown saliva. I had no choice but to hold it back with one hand and go for my pistol. When I'd finally managed to grab hold of it, I shoved the barrel of the gun down its throat and pressed the trigger before the lifeless body of the creature fell upon me. I jumped to my feet and shot the brains of the others, painting the walls in a layer of crimson. Fuck, I would have been dead if it wasn't for you, Carl said. Brian looked completely like he'd lost his shit and didn't say a word except for the weird, shivering and heavy breathing. Jessica cried her eyes out after chucking her saliva-filled helmet away to the side. Oh, we need to find a way out of here, I sighed. If the scientists manage to get out, then, then we sure as hell can as well. We quickly treated our injuries and reloaded our weapons. We were beginning to run low on ammunition. Only God knows what else this place has in store for us. I just wanted to get out of here. I'm 100% sure the others were of a like mind. I helped Jessica and the others get cleaned up. We sorted our helmets out before I pressed a button on the PDA and called HQ. HQ, do you copy? Over, I called out. This is HQ, loud and clear. What's your situation? The British guy replied. These assholes were developing a bioweapon capable of mutating normal human beings into creatures then locking them up with each other to find the strongest. I recommend immediate extraction to level this place to smithereens. We cannot afford to let this bioweapon get out in the open, I explained. Something this dangerous had the potential to single-handedly cause the mass extinction of mankind. The British guy went quiet for a moment before replying. Request for airstrike is pending. I'll get back to you as soon as I can once there's an update. Meanwhile, the SDF have been tirelessly working to decrypt the information you sent us. They've discovered a secret train line that leads to a bunker a few miles away. I think that's your best bet out of there. We're running low on ammo. I don't think we'll have any left if we encounter more waves of creatures. I explained, checking the few magazines I had left. Getting to that tunnel is your best chance of getting out of there. I'll get back to you once the airstrike has been approved. The British guy finished with a sincere tone. Damn it, there's two more levels of this bullshit before we get to the train line, Carl said, clearly looking frustrated at this whole situation. Yeah, I sighed, but it's our only chance of getting out of here before they level the place. 
Okay, we got no choice but to go deeper in this shithole. Let's get it over and done with, Brian added, before we all made our way out of the office. We spent another 20 minutes looking around for a way to the lower level, when we found a set of stairs leading down. We discovered another control room where a multitude of computers and screens displaying CCTV images of the entire complex presented itself. The power was still online here, and it looked as though someone had left in a hurry moments before. A still warm cup of coffee rested upon the desk along with a journal. I picked up the journal and began to scan through it when Brian noticed something on the screens. Someone was watching our every move, Brian pointed out. There were live feeds at the top two levels, where we'd just come from. Look, there, he nearly shouted, pointing at one of the feeds. There's someone there. There was a man, in full lab uniform, running to what looked like another set of stairs leading down. I bet that's the asshole who's been fucking around with us all this time, Carl stated. We need to follow him. I forced the journal into one of my pockets. You're right. Maybe we can get some answers from him. Let's move out. We rushed along the path that led to the man and made our way down to the final level below. The door had been left open. Once through, we found ourselves in a large lab covered on both sides with large concrete walls and a multitude of floodlights. Iron bulkhead door surrounded us on all four sides in the face of the structure. The figure of a man in the far end caught our attention. We rushed all the way down there with our weapons drawn. Hey! Carl shouted, pointing his rifle at the man's head. Turn around now! By that point, we all had our weapons pointed at the man. Once he turned, we noticed an empty syringe injected into his arm. A malicious laugh escaped his mouth. It's too late. I've already injected myself. With what? I asked hoping that it wasn't the bioweapon. This is a combination of years of advanced research, and now it's in me. I've created the ultimate bioweapon the world has ever seen. <laughs> he laughed once more. Cut the bullshit. What the fuck happened here? I shouted, cutting him off. You killed my children, and now you have the nerve to ask me what happened. In a few moments, you'll be dead anyway and the world will truly know what it's like to live in fear. So, I might as well tell you before you die. I spent years working as a geneticist for the SDF. After years of working my ass off, I was dismissed for experimenting on gene splicing. Well, it was then I decided I would carry on my work here for people who appreciated me. I perfected my formula and created these magnificent loyal creatures that follow my every order. You sick bastard. What have you done? I asked. The only reply I received was another malicious reply. And that was when dark veins began to appear on his face, and his skin began to morph. His body began to increase in size until he was at least eight feet tall. Rough scales began to form around his entire body, and a devilish red aura radiated from his eyes. Ah, fuck this! Carl said as he unloaded half a magazine into the creature's face. It was no use, as the bullets just bounced off the rock-hard skin that had still morphed. Oh, damn it. Okay, everyone get back to a safe distance. I have no idea what this bastard is capable of, I warned the others, when the situation suddenly went from being bad to being much worse. The doors surrounding us all clicked open, and hordes of humanoid creatures began pouring in like a river of ferocity. Damn it, we're surrounded, Brian stated, as we all huddled up back to back before letting our trigger fingers loose. The radio crackled with a British guy's voice. You have 20 minutes until the US Air Force drop a heap of bombs on the building. Get your asses out of there, he said. We are currently engaged with an army of these fuckers, we found the scientist behind this whole mess. He injected himself with a more advanced version of the bioweapon and transformed into a big ugly fucker. Our bullets have no effect on him. I finished as the hordes of creatures kept pouring out. You have 20 minutes to get out of there, the British guy shouted before the line went dead. 
We held the creatures back for what seemed like ages. Our rifles had run out of ammo, which resulted in us using our sidearms. We need to make our way to the tunnel, I shouted. If we carry on fighting them like this, we'll only end up dead. The others agreed, and we began fighting our way to the mouth of the tunnel. The giant creature followed us, but due to its larger size, it was considerably slower than the smaller ones. I shot my grenade launcher into the hordes of enemies that were bunched up, before I only had one final one left. Carl and Brian had used all their grenades. I kept the last one in case we needed to use it on the large fucker. Then we made our way to the door that led us onto the train track, and locked it shut moments before the horde began bashing it down. The tram that was here once was no longer there. We made our way along when suddenly a large explosion shook the ground like an earthquake. The fucker had destroyed a section of the wall and made its way along the tracks towards us with its little minions following along. I had no choice. I loaded my final grenade into the launcher and shot the ceiling over the tracks above the creature before a hail of concrete, dirt and gravel lodged itself in the tunnel blocking all access. We ran along the tracks with only moments to spare before the airstrike was due. Completely out of breath, I nearly fell to the ground once we were in the bunker at the other end. Brian kicked the door down before we ran outside into the wilderness of the forest. A loud, thunderous sound emanated above our heads, followed by the small outlines of a squadron of B-2 stealth bombers. We ran further into the forest in order to avoid any bombs that could have deviated from their flight path before the entire complex was engulfed in a massive ball of fire, followed by the rumbling of the earth beneath us. We had barely made it out alive. Fuck, that was a close one, Carl shouted, hiding behind the large trunk of a thick tree, as were all of us. Fucking hell, I can't believe we made it out with that one alive. I laughed, and that was when we noticed heavy footsteps in the distance. We all turned to face the large creature making its way towards us. Shit, Brian shouted. I'm all out, he frowned. We were all in the same situation, with only a handful of pistol rounds to our name. It wouldn't be enough to take down this son of a bitch. I called HQ as we turned to run. HQ, you there? What's your status, McCarthy? Oh, the B-52's decimated the place, but that big one's still alive. We're out of ammo, and we need assistance right away. I said before we began running deeper into the woods. We spent what seemed like ages running through the dense woodland until help arrived. Two H-64 Apache attack helicopters hovered above us. They couldn't successfully target the giant beast through the spines of the dense trees and kept their distance to avoid any projectiles that it might launch towards them. A similar tactic that the SDF would employ when fighting creatures of this magnitude. The radio crackled. McGarvey, this is Flight Lieutenant Torres. Do you copy? The frustrated voice of a man erupted. Loud and clear, I replied, nearly out of breath. The running had taken its toll on our bodies, we were slowing down almost to a point where the creature had caught up with us. The ground trembled with more force as it approached. I can't get a clear aim with all the trees in the way. You need to lure it into an open spot before we get clearance to fire the missiles, he said. Affirmative. We'll try our best, but all this running has taken its toll. I see a clearing about a half mile away in the direction of your running. If you can get to that, then I'll be able to get a clear shot. All right, I agreed, before explaining the situation to the others, who looked as though they were about to drop to the ground at any minute. I looked back and saw the outline of the creature squeezing through the trees. It's getting closer. We need to get to that clearing. I slowed down to let the others get in front of me, so I could keep an eye on them in case one of them succumbed to their exhaustion. With the creature just a dozen meters away, we finally made it to the clearing where a river cut through the forest. We trudged through the torrent of water, which reached up to our waists, when the creature leaped out from behind the trees and closed in. The creature's height advantage meant it would easily traverse the river faster than us. We were too slow and would be butchered. 
And then shots echoed from the Apaches before a hail of armor-piercing rounds cut through the giant body of the creature like hot knives going through butter. The Apaches hovered above the river on both sides before a storm of Hellfire missiles struck their mark. Chunks of flesh and bone showered the area, some falling into the river, with a dark green liquid oozing out from the carcass of the beast, dissipating into the body of the clear water. Oh, for fuck's sake, Carl stated. That shit's going into the river. I tapped the radio and called the British guy. HQ, come in. I'm here. What's up? He asked. Oh, we have a problem. The remains of that creature are contaminating the river. You can need to sort this shit out before it becomes a bigger problem. All right. I'll let the authorities know. Your evac is en route. He finished before the line went dead. Before we set off back to base, we were treated for minor injuries and were given a chance to rehydrate and dispel our hunger. The military rations sucked, but the pain in our stomachs caused us to silently eat what we were given without complaint. Jessica was flown to the nearest military hospital, where she'd be treated for her ears before they flew the rest of us back to the farmhouse. We happily removed our armor and were given the opportunity to shower up. The British guy had brought us some home-cooked food to eat before all of us, minus Jessica, sat around the table once more. The authorities are currently dealing with the contaminated river. It could potentially lead to the local wildlife mutating into creatures. Jessica is being treated. The doctors are saying she should make a full recovery within a month. The SDF sent a team to gather samples from the creature's dead body. While scouring through the data that you sent us, they discovered an unknown agency was behind the illegal tests that were being conducted on humans. And we have reason to believe that the formula is still in the hands of these inhumane bastards. We don't know who they are, but we do know they have a ton of funding behind them. The US government has tasked me with setting up a private military company to get to the bottom of this. I completely understand if you guys don't want to sign on, but the fate of the entire country depends on us. Can I count on you guys again in the future? We all nodded and agreed. That's great. There will be uh, plenty of opportunities to make more money. The man passed each of us a thick envelope of cash. As promised, there is your pay. Fifty thousand each. We all looked at each other and smiled, opening the envelopes. Uh, there's nothing like a good payday, especially after the hell that we'd all been through. My men are ready to take you all home. I'll be in contact with all of you once we're set up and ready to go. He finished before dismissing us. But before I could exit the room, he called me back. Ah, uh, McCarthy, can I have a private word with you before you go? Yeah, sure. What's up? I asked. This unit I've been tasked with creating will be working closely with the SDF. You have the most experience working with them. I want you to take command of the unit. Is that something you'd be interested in? Well, leading the unit will be more work. If the money's right, then I don't see a problem, I replied. Oh, I'll make sure you're looked after. Take care of yourself, he finished before letting me go. I bid the others farewell outside after we exchanged phone numbers to keep in contact with each other. I entered the black SUV before setting off for home. Well... That's all I have for now. I'll be in contact with you all very soon once I receive word back from the British guy. I still don't know his name, but I think it's better if it stays that way. I managed to get hold of Jessica to make sure she's all right. She's made a full recovery and ended up with a decent paycheck. Now, you take care of yourselves out there. Till next time. So it always gives me great pleasure to work with a new author, somebody I haven't worked with before. Obviously I have my favourites and I do like to develop a strong relationship with the uh, writers that whose stories I read, but always nice to uh, work with a new one, especially when the story's as good as that. Did you enjoy that one? Comments, likes, loves, and all that kind of thing in the comment section below the video, please, and I'll do my best to... Uh, 
Let's see if, how many I can reply to, as I always do. Oh, well, another long one for you. Getting all these long ones done, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun for me. I do like getting my teeth into a good story, but a lot of hard work as well. But I will be back again on my other channel tomorrow, and I'll be back here on Friday. Do you like these daily stories? Hope you do. <laughs> Until next time, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>